A Trump employee previously identified in the Mar-a-Lago criminal indictment as employee number five is now speaking out and breaking his silence. His name is Brian Butler. He worked at Mar-a-Lago for over 20 years up until 2022 when he hired his own independent lawyers. And now he's telling CNN the crimes that he saw take place, which he previously relayed to the FBI. We will break it all down. Also, Donald Trump earlier today filed a motion in the Manhattan District Attorney criminal case against him, which is set for trial on March 25th. And Donald Trump is claiming absolute presidential immunity in that case. He's filing a motion to exclude everything that happened while he was in office and also to adjourn the trial, to stop the trial, and ultimately throw it out on absolute presidential immunity grounds. We're going to break that down. This is conduct that occurred before he was in office. So what he's essentially arguing is that because he tried to cover up the crime while he was in office, that should serve as a way to provide immunity for the crimes that took place before he was in office. The way I have previously described it on a hot take earlier in the day, if you were to rob a bank, then become president, and then try to cover up the robbery, you would do exactly what Donald Trump's doing and say you have absolute presidential immunity because of your cover-up. We'll break it all down. Donald Trump, a big loser in the case against E. Jean Carroll. He tried to avoid posting that bond, but he ultimately had to post a $91.6 million surety bond. He did not post it himself. He had a company called Federal Insurance Company or Chubb actually post the bond in that case. Donald Trump put some fine print in there to try to say that he had 60 days to pay if he were to lose on the appeal. E. Jean Carroll made sure it was a 30-day period and that the money would be immediately transferred. Another win for E. Jean Carroll and her legal team. Also, immediately after President Joe Biden's electric, inspiring, and hopeful State of the Union that I'm sure you watched here live on the Midas Dutch Network, Donald Trump spent his time honoring Hungary's authoritarian leader, Viktor Orban, at his club, telling Orban things like he would cut off aid to Ukraine and allow Vladimir Putin to win. That's how Trump would solve the problem. Trump spent his time defaming his rape victim, mocking stutterers, spreading lies about the 2020 election while glitching on stage, insisting over and over again as part of his stump speech that he is not in cognitive decline and mixes up names on purpose and promising to cut Social Security and Medicare. And he was only getting started, folks. The Republicans then proceeded to give a disastrous response to the State of the Union, which has been widely panned and mocked on Saturday Night Live. Donald Trump was then humiliated in front of the entire world by Jimmy Kimmel during the Oscars. And President Biden uh, really kind of kicking into overdrive right now at the right time as the campaign really starts to heat up. President Biden's been traveling around the country. He's got a swing state schedule um, where he's going around spreading the message of pro-democracy, of normalcy, of compassion. I think it's really resonating and he kind of is peaking at the right time. We'll talk about all of that more. This is the Midas Touch podcast. Brett and Jordy, it's great to see you. Brett, I know you've been doing a lot of traveling. We last saw you at a hotel room in Washington, <laughs> D.C., because as we told our viewers, your favorite thing to do is to travel to Washington, D.C., right. to watch the State of the Union from a hotel. Yeah, the move is always you want to travel to where an event is, but then actually go to the event. You cover it from down the road in your hotel room. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, I, I, I had a great trip in, in Washington, D.C. I just got back sometime in the middle of the night last night. I I, I, I was, had an opportunity to visit Jordy, hang with Jordy, meet my little nephew, which was Let's go. The, the greatest oh. thing of all time. Honestly, such an absolute joy. But oh my gosh, was my flight home the biggest disaster of all with maintenance issues on the plane and having to deep plane and just I, i'm not i won't bore you with the details but it was a not 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 a fun experience but my trip was a very successful trip i had such a great time in washington dc met with so many incredible people including and 
deep teas over here, including with the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, Ooh. which was just absolutely incredible and had an opportunity to share with her all about the pro-democracy movement here at Midas Touch, which she was very familiar with. And it was uh, just a great thing. You know what? I, I really want to get into the details on this, but I think I, I save it for the Patreon so we can get into the news of the day because I know we have deep a lot to tease. discuss. Deep I love it. Tease. Deep so, tease. I, you know, if you want to hear the story of the meeting with Vice President Harris, you go to patreon.com slash Midas Touch, sign up there for one of the tiers. I'll we'll tell the story on the after show. But it was such an incredible meeting, such an incredible weekend. And man, vibe shift or what? Last week, I think, was also like the vibe shift. I think when we look back on this pivotal election over in November next year, all future years, you know, looking back on this moment, we will say that that week was the week where everything sort of changed in this campaign. And so, you know, it was really cool to cover that State of the Union live and to see this momentum, you know, coming off that. It's it's just awesome. We'll get into all that. But Jordy, first, I want to check in and see how you're doing. B, I'm doing great, man. It was great to see you. Thanks so much for coming. That was so sweet for you to stop on over here before making your way back to LA. Sorry about the fights, but baby Elijah loved seeing you, Brett. So, man, just super stoked that you came through. Ben, you're up next, man. You're up next. I'm not going to tell you you have to come, but I'm going to say Brett's early lead for favorite uncle. So just throwing it out there. See what you could do. I like your sweatshirt today, Ben. That's a it's a great pale orange. Is that what you're wearing today? Looks good. I think, I think that's what the uh, color experts would call it, Jay. Thank Pastel. you, Ger. Thank you, you know. very, thank you very much. But like let me it. tell you, let me tell you who are not the experts on watching uh, pretty much anything. It's the kind of media punditry and right wing media, which has you know portrayed this narrative for so long, which they did in 2020. Also, it's just the exact same playbook that they're doing again versus actually looking at the data of Sleepy Joe this and and Joe Biden has dementia. He can't even say any words. And it'd be one thing if like that was true, you know, right. but like one of the reasons that we go play the clip, play the clip, let's show this, let's show this. And we don't just show clips that are like three seconds, like the right wing media does. If you were to clip me and find three seconds of something, I'm sure you'd be able to find, you know, basically anything. But we want to show you over time the way these speeches look and how they're being conveyed. And President Biden has actually always been the President Biden that we saw at the State of the Union, like that wasn't like a different fiery Biden. That's like the Biden we saw in Pueblo, Colorado when we met him. That's the, just because you're not reporting it doesn't mean that that's not what's actually happening. Ben, you know what people so, kind of forget also? It's like President Biden, in addition to campaigning to be the next president is also the president and has to do the job <laughs> of a president. So he can't go out there the same way that Donald Trump's been going out there for all this time and just do these rallies every day and these just bizarro <laughs> events. He's actually got to like lead the country. And so it's just such a ridiculous narrative that both the media and the right has pushed because yes, the guy has been being president. He has to both be president <laughs> and he has to campaign for re-election. And so this State of the Union was basically the you know, for all intents and purposes, like the kickoff to, okay, it's game time. Let's go game on campaign on. You think we have, you think we got started. We have not gotten started yet. We are just getting started now. And just you wait for what's to come. And well, we're seeing right now that Donald Trump is, you know, he's out there, he's bitter, he's angry. He's giving all these dark speeches. He's fumbling his words. He can't speak. He's defaming his rape victim. He's just, just disgusting. Everything that's the opposite of American values is what Donald Trump's doing. And he's really overexposed, honestly. And now you have President Biden coming out there swinging. And I think these Republicans and Donald Trump, they're not going to know what hit him once, once you see President Biden out there like we have. Like that was such a momentum shift. And it's already, already resonating with the American people. The timing's right, really good, right. Brad. And to your point, I mean, just the sense that Biden isn't, President Biden isn't overexposed. Like I feel like just Trump has like just beaten even his like loyalist followers down at this point where they they know his shtick. They know his thumb speech that he's going to take out there every single day. And it's disgusting. Right. But but he's so overexposed. That's the perfect that's the perfect synopsis of that. Being now President Biden's just gearing up and he's getting going. And also, do you want a president or like do you want like a performer? Like right. sometimes I feel like the media is like 
perform for me. And Brett, you said like, just you wait. It reminded me of Alexander Hamilton. It's like, okay, I want someone who's going to be getting into the weeds and the nuance and understands the issues. You know, I'm not, I don't want someone who's like Alexander Hamilton and starts doing like a play out. Like, like I want someone, I want someone who's a, who is a leader, and that's what President Biden's doing. And then on the other end, you've got Donald Trump cosplaying this like wannabe WWE bad guy character, you know, that is just like the person you would boo, you know, when you when we grew up watching what it was WWF for me. I'm like, what in the world is this? So I want to cover what's what's gone down at this Trump event over the weekend. I mean, like, you know, he spends his time mocking. Uh, people with the disability of, of stuttering and he like then does like a stuttering thing um, and then like the crowds laughing. It's some real despicable stuff. But before doing that, let's talk about the breaking news. And I think very, very big breaking news, a Monday bombshell, if you will, of this former Mar-a-Lago employee. Let me just set the stage. This is someone who worked at Mar-a-Lago since 2002 as a seasonal valet. He ended up basically starting a, a company that would do all of the um, uh, valet services and kind of driving the guests from Mar-a-Lago to the airport and built kind of a business around that. His name is uh, Brian Butler. He was very close friends with Carlos de Oliveira, one of Donald Trump's co-defendants, and was also very close to Waltine Nauta, Donald Trump's body man and kind of personal assistant, another one of Donald Trump's co-defendants. In his position as a driver, Brian Butler also was a witness to a lot of the people who left Mar-a-Lago. For example, remember that Australian billionaire Anthony Pratt? Yeah. who ended up bragging that Donald Trump had told him nuclear secrets about Australia and nuclear submarine arsenals and things like that. Butler was one of the people who tipped the FBI onto that because Pratt was in the car bragging to Pratt's chief of staff about getting the nuclear material. And so Butler told that to the FBI, among other things. But back in June of 2022, Butler got a very odd call from Waltine now to one of Donald Trump's co-defendants. And it was very unusual for how Brian Butler normally would operate. Waltine now to wanted to personally take these documents and watch them in Butler's car. These bankers boxes that you see in the indictment, Butler didn't really know like what was even going on, but just found the encounter to be very, very odd. Obviously, after the indictment, Butler put two and two together and was like, oh, that's the day. That was the day when the Department of Justice met with Donald Trump in June of 2022, June 3rd, 2022. Remember when Christina Bob and Evan Corcoran and Trump's lawyer signed the declaration that they had returned all of the boxes to the FBI and DOJ that day. Guess what we now know? It was in the indictment, but Butler talks about it. That's when Waltine Nauta and Trump took the boxes from Mar-a-Lago, put it in the truck being driven by Brian Butler, or the Escalade, drove it to an, an airplane and then loaded in the airplane to end up going to Bedminster in New Jersey. Raises another question. Where are those boxes right now, of course? Um, but Brian Butler speaking out right now. And I think one of the reasons why Butler is breaking his silence right now is because of the failure of Judge Eileen Cannon. And I think Brian Butler's looked at the case and he's like, look, I need to get my story out. Butler was like one of the biggest Trumpers. He spent his whole life around Trump. But then he saw what was happening with our nation's secrets. And he's like, I can't take this anymore. And by the way, I think Butler would have kept his silence again, but for the fact that Trump's judge, Judge Eileen Cannon, has delayed this thing forever. Her docket's a complete mess. But why don't we show this one short clip from CNN of Caitlin Collins' exclusive with Brian Butler. Hat tip, by the way, Caitlin Collins for getting this exclusive. Play this clip. And then what happened is Walt left before me, and he never goes directly to the plane. He's either in the motorcade or when he goes there with the boss, which the former president. And I remember telling him he left the club with, I, I didn't know what he had in his vehicle, but he waited for me at a nearby business, and I told him I would tell him when I was leaving Mar-a-Lago. So I left Mar-a-Lago, I texted him, hey, I'm on my way. 
he followed me. He pulled out and got behind me. We got to the airport. I ended up loading all the luggage I had, and he had a bunch of boxes. You noticed that he had boxes. Oh, yeah. They were the uh, boxes that were in the indictment, the white banker's boxes. That's what I remember loading. And did you have any time, any idea at the time that there was potentially U.S. national security secrets in those boxes? No clue. No, I had no clue. I mean, we were just taking them out of the Escalade, piling them up. I remember they were all stacked on top of each other, and then we're lifting them up to the pilots. How many who, boxes was it? You know, they asked me in, in the interview, and I, I believe it was I, 10 to 15 is what I remember. I know, they I know being it was, the investigators. Correct. Wow, wow, Brett, Jordy, your reaction to that. I thought it was important that I gave the framework, though, before playing that clip of, like, who he is, the fact that he was there for all of that time. His perspective right here is just so powerful, and it just goes to show you the lengths uh, and the criminal intent at issue. Before throwing it to you, Brett, or Jordy, on this, one more thing I, I want to say here. So Trump's argument before Judge Eileen Cannon, there's going to be a hearing on March 14th. She actually found this issue has enough merit where she wants to hear a, do a hearing on it. And she also accepted amicus brief from Stephen Miller's group, like America Legal Foundation or whatever they're called. That's the group that files all of those lawsuits against corporations for discriminating against white males. They filed a brief to this effect on that. Trump's argument is not that he didn't do it. Not only is his argument that he telepathically declassified these documents, which is one thing in and of itself, his claim is that our nuclear secrets, our national defense information actually belongs to him personally, that they're not presidential records, that they belong to him. He says that when he packed this information, put it in boxes, and then shift it and shipped it to Mar-a-Lago, that converted the property from belonging to we the people to Trump personally so that it's actually his and that there is no criminal implications. All you could do is file a civil case to try to get it back. And I just want to say this, and I, I said this in another hot take, that's the equivalent of somebody robbing your house and then taking, I mean, if you're we the people robbing your house and then saying, it's mine now because I put it in my car. And then you, the victim of the robbery, this is to the Trump supporters out there, basically saying, yeah, it's his. He, he put it in the car now. So it, 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 belongs, it belongs to him. That's how you know you're in a cult. This shouldn't be a political issue. This is we, the people. Our nuclear secrets, our codes, our sensitive information, our national defense information, it doesn't belong to President Biden, didn't belong to Obama, it doesn't belong to Donald Trump, to Ronald Reagan, it doesn't belong to any of them. It is a sickening argument that he's making. We've heard the you know phrase growing up, remember, finders keepers, finders keepers, losers weepers. Well, Trump's argument in court seems to be stealers keepers, that he could steal whatever he wants and then it's just his and it's his property. And you're right, Ben, it's, it's fundamentally anti-American. And this is truly my biggest issue with the modern day Republican Party and this MAGA movement that has so infected this Republican Party because it used to, we used to have a common set of American values, right? And I think this is one of the defining issues of this election, this notion of American values. What do we stand for as a country and who is this nation for? And what we are seeing is that this modern day Republican Party has been co-opted by this faction that says America stands for Donald Trump. It doesn't stand for the values that we've had for hundreds of years. It doesn't stand for the Constitution. It doesn't stand for the rule of law. It stands for whatever is in the benefit of Donald Trump. And that's my biggest issue. Like, honestly, beyond any single policy you could throw at me behind, beyond any policy debate, beyond any disagreement I may have with somebody on the other side of the aisle, you know, that is my biggest, my, my biggest thing. And just the lies and the doubling down on the lies and then the gaslighting to try to act like 
you're in the wrong for defending American values and that Trump is actually the right one here. The whole thing is just flipped on its head and it's incredibly disturbing that we now have as one of the major political parties, a cult, a, 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 it's a cult. Mm -hmm. And that's no better embodied than by the fact that they just made Lara Trump the co-chair <laughs> of the Republican party, the Trump takeover of this political party is absolutely complete. And we're already seeing the ramifications of that. They are doing mass firings right now at the RNC. We're learning where the Trump team is expected to push out about 60 or more of the staffers because they only want wow. loyalists in there. They are installing somebody to watch the money. Uh, and we know how that's going to work out when they're watching the money for Donald Trump that comes into the RNC. And so Donald Trump's goal with all of these cases is never to say, I'm innocent. I didn't do it. It's kind of acknowledging like, yes, I did it, but I'm allowed to do it. But, but by using this kind of perverse ideology, these bizarre arguments, and then just trying to postpone and delay as much as possible, just like you brought up the Manhattan DA case, which we'll get into more, but it's all about it's not about the merits of what he's doing and, oh, let's look into like the legal, uh, the, the scholarly legal arguments that they're making. It's all just designed to push the ball down the road, kick the can down the road and to make it so this lasts so he could hopefully catch a break in November. But we're not going to let that happen. Well, look, you talk about what's Donald Trump filing before Judge Eileen Cannon in the Mar-a-Lago document case, the case where we see employee number five who's Brian Butler, saying, I worked Trump for 20 years. This isn't a witch hunt. I saw I saw Trump do it. I was there, everybody. I saw it happen. So Trump's filing in that case, well, we can't go to trial. Judge Cannon, you need to delay everything. I'm about to start the Manhattan District Attorney case. That case starts on March 25th. So you got to slow this down. We're getting ready for that trial. What does he file in the Manhattan District Attorney case? I'm entitled to absolute presidential immunity in this case. Look, the Supreme Court granted certiorari in the Washington, D.C. Uh, criminal case, so the federal case there. So you should basically say that I'm entitled to absolute immunity and adjourn the trial date there. You know, when I saw the Supreme Court grant certiorari on the issue of absolute presidential immunity a few weeks back, I texted our group of employees who work at Legal AF and I said, let me tell you what he's going to do. He's going to make that argument in the Manhattan District Attorney case. And a lot of people said, on what grounds? What are you talking about? I said, it doesn't matter what grounds. He's going to make the argument. I didn't do a hot take on it because I didn't want to be accused later of giving him guidance on what to do, but I knew he was going to do it anyway because I study his moves the way we do. So we have that text message, which I'm not going to pull up there, but his can argument, <laughs> you could confirm it, We, you know, can but in, in the Manhattan District Attorney criminal case, his argument for why he claims he should have absolute presidential immunity is sure. The hush money payments, the Stormy Daniels, the underlying conduct occurred before Trump was in office, right? But the cover-up that he tried to do, which is some of the checks that he tried to funnel as legal expenses, um, some posts that he made on social media where he lied about what was happening and what Michael Cohen's role was, right? That those – the cover-up gives him the immunity – for the crime itself. And so the example I give is you rob the bank, you go into office, you start talking about the bank robbery that you did before you were in office, and then you claim you're immune from prosecution from the bank robbery because you tried to cover it up while you were in office. That's his argument. Now, he also tried to make an argument like this in federal court before uh, a federal judge in New York. Remember when he tried to remove that Manhattan district attorney case to federal court, and then the judge rejected that. And Trump basically would seem to have waived, and the judge made the argument, you know, said the order. Trump waived the claim of absolute presidential immunity uh, there. 
But what I think Trump is just trying to set up right now is he's going to go to the Supreme Court. He's going to get rejected by Judge Juan Mershon. The, the trial court judge is going to reject it. I think Trump will try to get emergency stays and deadlines from the appellate division. You know, who knows what they're going to do there. They should reject it. But his plan is going to be, he's going to go to the Supreme Court and he's going to say, look, You've got this April 25th oral argument in the Washington, D.C. case. So what you should do is shut down this March case until you rule on the until you rule then on the Washington, D.C. case, shut down the Manhattan D.A. case. And, and the interesting part about it is it will go through the federal court. So we'll have to make an emergency pre- uh, petition to Justice Sotomayor. Um, and the the way the Supreme Court has been dealing with these kind of controversial issues in general is the justice will then submit it to the full court for consideration and usually grant a short temporary stay. We'll see what Justice Sotomayor does, but I can see people getting upset and say, oh my God, that's an Obama appointee and she just made a move, but that's what they're doing on all of these cases across the country for a short period of time. And then it'll get referred to the full Supreme Court. And then the question becomes is, does he find those four justices who will grant a stay of the case? Because that's what he's, I want to prepare you what he's positioning for. Now, we talk a lot about legal cases. And ultimately, I think all of this stuff's going to backfire for Trump because we, the people, are getting absolutely pissed, right? We, the people, are getting so annoyed at all of this and everything that's going on here. And then I think it's going to have an opposite reaction than what he ultimately wants. Um, And that's why I want to talk about what's happening in the various, um, you know, in these campaign speeches and whatnot. But for now, that's the update in Manhattan DA. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we've got a lot to talk about. Let's take our first quick break of the show. Running Midas Touch takes up just about all of my time, like seriously, most of it. That's why when I needed a workout that was convenient and effective, Total Gym turned out to be a total game changer. Do you want a total body workout in just 10 to 20 minutes? Well, you need to try Total Gym. Right now, you could try Total Gym for 30 days for just $1 plus free shipping. Seriously, $1. The Total Gym Fit, Total Gym's newest model, lets you do over 85 exercises in one home gym, and you'll never get bored working out again. And Total Gym accommodates all fitness levels from ages 8 to 80, so literally anyone listening to this can enjoy the Total Gym. I did a Total Gym workout literally today. I did a lower body workout, and Total Gym comes with all these note cards that help you build your workout plan depending on what muscles you're trying to hit. How Total Gym works is by using a percent of your body weight as resistance. You set the resistance level higher to build muscle, lower to tone and slenderize. The unique design allows you to easily move from one exercise to another without having to add or remove weights. That means you could do strength training, cardio, and stretching all in one machine. I've been bragging to my brothers every day about the progress I made on Total Gym, and with each workout, I've been increasing the incline, and I feel myself getting stronger every single day. Plus, with Total Gym, there is no assembly required. It sits up in minutes right out of the box, and it conveniently folds for storage under your bed or in your closet. What makes Total Gym so effective? Well, you work out multiple muscle groups simultaneously, so what used to take 60 plus minutes now only takes 10 to 20 minutes with Total Gym. And Total Gym can now be found in over 4 million homes, so they aren't just another fitness trend. They are a brand you could trust. Remember, it only takes 10 to 20 minutes a day to reshape your body. Head to TotalGymDirect.com slash Midas for an additional 20% off your order. Plus, that includes a free ab crunch attachment and free shipping. The special offer won't be available for much longer. That's TotalGymDirect.com backslash Midas for an additional 20% off. And make sure you go to our URL, TotalGymDirect.com slash Midas, so they know I sent you. That's M-E-I-D-A-S. Trade Coffee is here to help you make better coffee at home. Trade brings roasted to order coffee for more than 55 of the nation's top roasters right to your doorstep. Stay tuned for a new special offer for Midas Touch listeners in just a moment. I don't know about you, but this is the time of the year where I need pick-me-ups, and my trade deliveries are always a bright spot in my week. Trade is a subscription service that sources the best coffee from local roasters across the country and brings it to your doorstep so you can enjoy their craft from the comfort of your own home. There's multiple ways to experience coffee with trade. 
guide. Sign up for a subscription or try one of their starter packs today. I think by now everybody knows that I am the resident coffee geek here at Midas Touch, and trade has been such a convenient way to get my weekly coffee fix. Now, I never have to worry about where my next bag is going to come from, and I swear every bag that I get is better than the next. I just received this bag from a local roaster here in California called Equator Coffees. It's a single origin blend from Peru. You see here it has notes of orange and graham cracker and caramel. It's absolutely incredible. I am loving every second of it. You really have to try Trade Coffee. I cannot recommend it enough. Jumpstart your daily coffee routine right now by signing up for a Trade subscription. And right now, Trade is offering up to $15 off select plans and you get your first bag of coffee free. Just visit drinktrade.com slash Midas. That's drinktrade.com slash Midas for a free bag and up to $15 off select subscription plans. That's drinktrade.com slash Midas. Let's, Welcome back. Brett, That's let's like know. Brett's dream right there, Brett. That was when we got trade coffee. Brett was over the moon because everyone knows he's our coffee nerd. And by the way, I have to say, quick anecdote. When Brett was here, well, Brett, you're, you're looking really good. Like, what's what are you doing? He's like, dude, it's the total gym. Kids, kids been hitting it like literally every day. And Brett, I gotta say, man, it's it's pretty dang, pretty dang legit. So as you know, links to all our description of both the YouTube and audio. Click, it takes you right there. Use our promo code. Let them know we sent you. We appreciate you guys. I I love those too. And yeah, literally, I use both products every day. It's the, the best. Check them out. Love it. So with literally hours remaining, Donald Trump posted the $91.6 million bond in the E. Jean Carroll case, although Alina Habba told us how rich Donald Trump is and it would be very easy for him to just post the bond himself. He had to use a surety and he used a company called Federal Insurance, which is known as Chubb and more kind of common. It's common doing business as name. And uh you know, what was interesting, too, when you read the fine print of the uh, surety agreement, Trump, he tried to pull like a fast one last minute, too. And basically, they would have had 60 days after the uh, Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Ultimately, I think when they affirmed the judgment, um, they would have like a 60 day period before paying. Um, and E. Jean Carroll over the weekend negotiated that to make it 30 days after Donald Trump loses the appeal for that money to be immediately transferred into E. Jean Carroll's account. The way these bonds work is you usually have to pay a non-refundable premium. That's about 10 to 20 percent of what the overall amount is. So anywhere from probably 10 to 15 million dollars that Trump will never see back um, in order to be able to post this bond. Ultimately, Trump would be on the hook for the full amount based on his agreement with the surety who's posting the bond. But in the event Trump doesn't pay, there's now a deep pocket insurance company that's that's able to pay. And I, I, I've read a lot of different kind of stories and accounts of, oh, this money came from Russia or this is clearly kind of Vladimir Putin's money. And, you know, look, based on my initial analysis, um, you know, the way it's been posted in this federal court, I, I don't know if there are other machinations outside of this that are more complex. I, I don't, I, I haven't personally seen any evidence of of that here? You know, it's it's a company that has a, a longstanding history of being involved in a business like this. You know, I think it raises some questions why they did this specifically. Um, you know, here and and, and but I, I'll just say it, it it's it seems to be a company that posts bonds like this. That's what that's one of the business lines that they do. So now the question turns to the New York Attorney General civil fraud judgment, and there. Trump would have to pay a non-refundable premium of somewhere in the range of 40 to 50 million dollars to secure the surety bond of 464 million dollars with pre and post judgment interest. So the question there is is that something that he was able to work out with them as well? We don't we don't know that yet, but you know, I also think it just shows you with E. Jean Carroll and Roberta Kaplan, like with Donald Trump, he's going to do every tactic of a sociopath. 
He's going to beg the judge. He's going to say that you're okay with him not paying. He'll throw every tactic the same way he did to try to overthrow the result of the 2020 election. It doesn't matter. Logical consistency doesn't matter. He'll throw every roadblock. But you got to corner him like the rat that he is. And then you got to just kind of push and push and push. And he gives up. He gives up. He's a weak loser who has bankrupted everything he's touched, almost everything he's touched his entire life. When you go through through some of these disclosures that he has to file, you know, like when he's doing the SPAC and things like that, it lists so many bankruptcies and so many failed businesses like over and over again. He's not a builder. He's a destroyer. And frankly, he's a loser as well. And so you just got to and, and this is frankly why I like the pro-democracy community's approach to him and why I'm so disgusted by what the Republican Party's become. The Republican Party is like, yeah, whatever, just do what you want to do to us. And the pro-democracy community is like, screw that. Why would we give in to this loser? Like, no, what are you talking about? And that's like the big one of the threat to your point. There's one of the big disconnects. That's not even a political thing. It's just like, do you have any pride in yourself kind of thing, you know? Yeah, I mean, if they had any modicum of self-respect, they would be pushing back every day. And Donald Trump never would have taken over the Republican Party if they had any bit of self-respect. But the fact is, once he started winning, they all just basically kind of folded and 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 got behind him and decided, OK, I guess we're just going to like uh, bow down to this cult leader now. I guess we're a cult now. That's that, that's it. And then even the people who you know know that it's all BS, who know that he's an idiot, who talk so much crap behind his back publicly go out there and say just the most most embarrassing, humiliating things, but there are real world consequences to their action. And they are walking this country right off of a cliff in their actions, what they're doing. Let me and do. Then, the and then Brett, let me just say this real quick. It just allows you then if you're the Republican party to open up the floodgates and, and let his family like then like get his teeth into you and then infect you with everything dumb Trump. Like the fact that Larry Trump is the co-chair in the RNC, I know we mentioned it earlier, but it is utterly ridiculous. And we can't highlight enough now that there is a report that about 60 RNC uh, employees are, are, are going to be gone, moved aside. So Lara Trump could bring in her, I don't know, yes people around them so they could keep an eye on the money. I mean, it's utterly ridiculous how far this party has fallen. And honestly, regardless of how the 2024 election shapes out, I don't see it ever getting any better under this current Republican Party, you know, regime in the sense that they all have this mindset right now that it doesn't matter. You know, democracy doesn't matter to them at the end of the day. The only thing that matters to them is continuing to win their you know, primary elections, winning their elections, you know, in-house. They don't want to actually lead as long as the Republican Party at large can continue on an individual basis to earn money off of their elected seats then they don't care. Then they don't want to fix it because this Republican Party does not care about democracy. It's bizarre. Yeah, they pushed out any talented people. They've promoted all of these MAGA people who have these like horrific views who many of them are even like just as bad and weirder versions of Trump, if that's even possible. Yes, and some of them are literally murderers. Like in yeah. the past yeah. week, we saw we saw like what one guy who was a Trump endorsed person running for Congress who was arrested for murder. Murder. Um, and then murder. there was and then I saw yesterday there was somebody else who I don't think was running for Congress. I could get the exact details, but it was somebody who had a lot of influence in one of these state Republican parties or something who was also arrested for murder. And so, like, I mean, that's what we're dealing with here. It, it's an extremist movement and they're playing to the most extreme forces within that extremist movement. And so that's what you're going to get. Yeah. You know, you remember when they did the uh, Colorado fourth congressional district and they had that uh, debate where Lauren Boebert was there with all the other people. And the moderator said, you know, raise your hand if you've been arrested before. And I think everybody but one person like raised, uh, they, they all raised their hands and they'd all been arrested. And they all like laughed at that and thought that was hilarious that they've that they've all been arrested. But then again, you know, when you idolize someone like Donald Trump, who gives these speeches that so lower that so lowers any type of, you know, morality at all, like that's that's like when you're like, who are these people in the audience laughing at this and like they, they're, they're horrible people. I don't know what to say. If you laugh at somebody, an adult who is mocking people for the disability of stuttering 
and then doing an impression of somebody stuttering and you clap for that there's something seriously wrong you're unwell you're 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 not you're not you're unwell you're not acting and behaving like an adult you have horrific character that's not how we should just be acting and like we'll show you some clips in a bit of president biden saying like i can't believe i even have to say this like you have these Trump supporters who are bringing their kids to events with signs that say F you on them and have all these curse words like like that's not acceptable in our in our country. Let's just start off with Trump's speech in Georgia, Rome in Rome, Georgia. Trump began the speech over the weekend mocking President Biden for stuttering. Here, play this clip. Two nights ago, we all heard Crooked Joe's angry, dark, hate filled rant of a state of the union address wasn't it didn't it bring us together emergency operator bring the country to 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 together i'm going to bring it i mean the fact that people would laugh at that is just so utterly and for insane. context marjorie taylor's green district is is rome georgia which i think is helpful with you think about who who's in that crowd right now it's the people who are voting for marjorie taylor green and that that clips the perfect example of the trump projection right speaking about the darkness of the Biden State of the Union speech trying to tear us apart as he is on a rant, mocking somebody for their stutter and getting the audience to laugh at this person. Like, like uh, President Biden's speech was optimistic. It was about possibilities. It was about progress. It was about who we are as Americans. And every single one of Donald Trump's speeches are, are about how horrible America is. It, they're about how, you know, he's just mean towards everybody. He's confused. He plays QAnon music. He highlights the January 6th insurrectionists and songs he sings with them. It's th That is the darkness. The Trump, the entire Trump brand now, I think, is one of, of criminality and darkness. Yeah, and that's, and, and it's just right out there. Like, that's why, you know, if, if you watch some of the weekend shows based on the way the media portrays the story, it's kind of like the lesser of two evils is the way the media tries to portray this. And it's like, I think little by little, and we, we, the people need to push the media as well. And we need to call them out. We need to be so loud about their behavior as well and hold them accountable because it's like, what are you talking about? I mean, you've got Trump mocking people for stuttering. You've got Trump saying that Ukraine and Russia wouldn't be fighting if he was in office because he knows Putin. He calls Putin Putin. I know Putin well. Here, play this clip. When Trump was, when Trump was president, there were none of these problems. Israel wouldn't have been attacked. Ukraine and Russia wouldn't be fighting. I knew Putin. I know him very well. He was no way he was going in. And again, I know Putin very well. And just like even the fact the way he talks about himself, Trump, like that's weird. Like that's very bizarre. Like every aspect of this is beyond weird, including his, I, I, I know Putin very well. And here, one of the things that Trump says as well as he continued to glitch, he says that he was a political appointee of President Biden. Here, play this clip. That's why they're weaponizing law enforcement for high-level election interference against Joe Biden's top and only political appointment, a guy named me. It's a guy named me. A guy named me. A political appointment. What are you talking about? Then Donald Trump appeared confused while claiming that pundits are saying that there will be violent attacks on him. Here, play this clip. Pundits and inside sources say that the attacks on me will be violent. They say that it's violent. Uh, the attacks, Biden said it. He said, you know what their whole plan is? It was just released the other day. No, it, didn't, it was leaked. That's kind of the speech that he gives. And as I said, like, if it wasn't Donald Trump, I, I would feel bad for the person saying that because he's just up there. As I said, he's not speaking in sentences. Like, he's he's just saying a maga mush of words together and doing accordion hands. And it's just really strange to watch. Here's him glitching while claiming that Mar-a-Lago was raided. Play this clip. They raided my house in Florida, Mar-a-Lago. They raided with no rate. They had no reason to do so. They violated. And then again, what? And then uh, who talks like that? Like again, they were like, it's like, 
shut up. Like, as I've said, as we show you more of these clips, it's like, if someone like this worked at a company you were affiliated with, large, small, big, medium size, a nonprofit, a social gathering, a group of people you play cards with, your fantasy football league, if somebody was behaving like this, I truly hope that you would kick them out. And, and, and instead, the Republicans want to give this person the nuclear codes. He, he can't even stand there and behave in a in a normal – you want to give that guy the nuclear codes? I mean, here he struggles to say the word compliments. Play this clip. Rack. All compliments of an incompetent – that's the part where he plays the QAnon music as well, while people hold up the QAnon symbols in the crowd. He made the Here same he face there that he did when he did the last one. When he went, ah. he did ah. the same sort of like his face scrunches up, like, you know, in, in pain and agony kind of almost when he glitches like that. If you notice, it's been happening a lot lately. No, I'm sorry. Continue. Here he talks about being a crumb of a nation. Here, play this clip. Crime ridden nation. We have become a nation like nobody thought possible and here he talks about why he thinks suburban women support him he says that he's the protector of women he says that he protects women here play this clip and then so what happened is she asked me that horrible question about women women love me you know i protect women i protected i protect he then goes on to defame the woman he was adjudicated to have raped E. G. Carroll. He spends his time at his campaign speech mocking and defaming a woman who he was found liable for raping. Play this clip. Sometimes it's not good to be rich. I just posted a $91 million bond, $91 million on a fake story, totally made up story. Think of it. $91 million. I could say things about what it would cost normally. 91 million based on false accusations made about me by a woman that I knew nothing about, didn't know, never heard of. I know nothing about her. She wrote a book. She said things. And when I denied it, I said, it's so crazy. It's false. I got sued for defamation. That's where it starts. Notice there, too, obviously what he said is horrific, but he goes, I know what it would cost to pay normally. Did you notice that he said that in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, was he talking was about the payoffs that he has to make to people like Stormy Daniels for $150,000 or Karen McDougal for around the same range? Was he saying that he kind of previously had created a market to pay off victims or to make hush money payments? And he thinks that that market for grabbing women by their genitals, which he brags about on tape, is actually less than when he's adjudicated to have engaged in sexual assault by a jury. And he knows he's the market maker for the amount of money you have to pay when you sexually assault people he 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 knows better than and he's speaking about this let's not forget at a campaign rally where you're supposed to talk about things like improving wages and protecting veterans and our national security i mean it's it's horrific horrific stuff then he went on cnbc squawk box and talked about how he's not conservative. Here, play this clip. We're going to turn our country around. We're going to bring sense and, and common sense. You know, people say you're conservative. I'm not conservative. You know what I am? I'm a man of common sense. Says I'm not conservative. We know you're not a conservative at all. And that's why, by the way, we here at Midas Touch for years, and now others are catching on, we said do not call the Republican Party conservative. They're not conserving. And there's nothing conservative about him. Here, Trump says he'll cut Social Security and Medicare. Play this clip. You changed your, your outlook on how to handle entitlement, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Mr. President, it seems like it, it, something has to be done or else we're going to be at a, stuck at 120% of, of debt to GDP forever. So first of all, there is a lot you can do in terms of entitlements in terms of cutting first off the cnbc questioner is a total clown he's had pete I Buttigieg on he's had other people on and he tries to grill them and cross-examine them what you should ask if you're asking questions like that is you donald trump added nine trillion dollars of that debt you're the one responsible for that so arsonist tell me how what your plan is for your fire 
And by the way, if Trump does a debate, which I don't think he'll actually end up doing, and I think he's positioning right now, and again, I think that we get really into his pathology, he's positioning now to ask Biden to debate now before the debates take place because Trump knows each passing day he gets more cognitively worse and worse and worse. So his oh, whole boy. thing is he's going to go, well, I said I would debate back in January or February, and now, now I don't want to debate later. He will not be able to answer actual serious questions on serious issues at all if he's asked real questions. And finally, on again, this Squawk Box interview, this is from NBC, right? So this is, you know, you hope that the, that this network is, you know, you know, moderate and honest and whatever, which they are absolutely not. They're just fueling Trump propaganda. But he manages to take these softballs and turn it into a way to defame his rape victim. Like he's getting these softballs and then he defames E. Jean Carroll again. Here, play this clip. If I didn't win an appeal on these ridiculous decisions, if I didn't win an appeal, the, the most ridiculous decisions including the Miss Bergdorf Goodman, a person I never, I never met. I have no idea who she is, except one thing, I got sued. From that point on, I said, wow, that's crazy what this is. I got charged. I was given a false accusation and had to post a $91 million bond on a false accusation. People aren't moving into New York because of the kind of crap uh, they're pulling on me. Right. And uh, I'm like, I feel like I'm a pioneer. I feel like I'm a pioneer for having to post a bond for defaming mm -hmm. your rape victim and being found to be an adjudicated sexual assaulter. And again, this is why when CNBC does something like that, they're talking about the financial markets. Frankly, CNBC, if that's how you behave, you have zero credibility. You should, it's malpractice for you to talk about business. Because if someone makes a statement that people are leaving Manhattan right now because of rape judgments against them and defamation judgments, and you as the reporter are unable to simply say, yeah, that's not true. The data is incorrect. And you go, yeah, okay. Well, then, then, then who are you? Like what yeah. a pathetic, pathetic interview. One point to make, though, the ultimate irony there, though, is that by Trump making the defamatory statement – on CNBC that way, where the host is based in New York, Trump's conduct is directed at the state of New York, which means that even if his Rome, Georgia statement that we played before, E. Jean Carroll would have to have sued in Georgia. The fact that Trump now has another defamatory act close in time in New York means that Trump could file this. I mean, that E. Jean wow. Carroll could file this a defamation case against Trump in New York in Manhattan federal court, it would get related. Judge Lewis Kaplan, who's already found him liable, it would be automatic liability and it would go before the jury. But Brett, I want you to talk about President Biden's. I want you to give the contrast there. Um, and I want you to talk about as well, some economic news, some news about energy that I want to highlight as well. Um, and I want to talk about what I see is, is real tangible momentum. Let's talk about all that after our last quick break of the show. Did you know that Fast Growing Trees is the biggest online nursery in the U.S. with more than 10,000 different kinds of plants and over 2 million happy customers in the United States, including this guy? You can grow lemon, avocado, olive, or fig trees inside your home on top of the wide variety of house plants available. Fast Growing Trees makes it easy to order online and your plants are shipped directly to your door in one to two days. And all along with their 30-day Alive and Thrive guarantee, they offer free plant consultation forever, which I absolutely love. I love fast growing trees and I recently got their most popular small avocado tree at a great price. Traditional landscaping could be so expensive, but fast growing trees provides a great product at amazing prices, and I strongly recommend you check out Fast Growing Trees immediately. The experts at Fast Growing Trees curate thousands of plants so you can find the perfect fit for your specific climate, location, and needs. That's what I did. You don't have to 
to drive around to nurseries and big gardening centers. Fast growing trees makes it easy to order online and your plants are shipped to your door in one to two days. Fast growing trees has in-house experts ready to help you make the right selection with growing and care advice available 24 seven. You can talk to a plant expert about your soil type, landscape design, how to take care of your plants and everything else you need. No green thumb required. Right now, they have the best deals online up to half off on select plants. And listeners to our show get an additional 15% off when using the code MIDAS at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com. Use the code MIDAS at checkout. That's fastgrowingtrees.com and then use the code MIDAS. Offer is valid for a limited time. Tell them that MIDAS sent you. I've tried so many different things to maintain a heart-healthy lifestyle like crash court diets or starting a daunting cardio routine, and frankly, it just hasn't been helpful for me. We often think living a more heart-healthy life means making big, unsustainable changes, but with Super Beats Heart Shoes, you can get daily blood pressure support in just two tasty chews a day, and they even promote heart-healthy energy without the stimulants. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Super Beats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. Heart health is important for me because I want to be around as long as possible for my loved ones. Super Beats Heart Shoes gives me the peace of mind that I'm doing the right thing and doing something good for myself every day. I take Super Beats Heart Shoes every morning and after taking them, I feel like I have more energy to take on the day. Super Beats Heart Shoes are a convenient way to support healthy blood pressure, no pills to swallow, no ingredients to mix or prepare. It's plant-based and no artificial sweeteners or colors. I cannot recommend Super Beats Heart Shoes enough to you, our viewers and listeners. Double your potential with Super Beats Heart Shoes. Get a free month supply of Super Beats Heart Shoes on all bundles and a free full-size bag of turmeric chews. Buy it at $25 with your order by going to MidasBeats.com. Yep, we got our own website there, folks. Get the exclusive offer only at MidasBeats.com, spelled M-E-I-D-A-S-B-E-E-T-S.com. Thank you. So, Brett, I kind of deliver the dark Donald Trump speech, and then I toss it to you for the, you know, for the hope. But the reality is, I think President Biden's got a lot of momentum right now kind of peaking at the right time. I don't even think kind of peaked yet. We've talked about it like yeah, you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it peaking at the right time. I'd say he's 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 rising now at the right time. He's taken his time and now it's go time and now he's going to go. So he'll peak at the right time which will be towards the election rather than the way Donald Trump's been doing it, which is just let's just throw everything to the wall at once and that's how you burn out. That's why he's broke in addition to a lot of other reasons. That's why the RNC is broke in addition to a lot of other reasons. There's no strategy happening right now on that side. And there are a lot of very smart people with the Biden campaign. And, you know, after the State of the Union, I'm still like, riveted by that State of the Union. I thought the State of the Union address was absolutely incredible. I thought that ad that President Biden released the day after the State of the Union was an incredible ad where he took the age issue head on and was fun and, and made a direct comparison and contrast with Donald Trump. And I started thinking about that famous Martin Luther King quote, right? Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And we've been so mired in the darkness that I think when you have these moments like President Biden at the State of the Union speaking so passionately and so optimistically about who we are as the United States of America, was it just me or does everybody else feel small? Like, does every do all the MAGAs, does Donald Trump, does all that stuff, they just appear so minuscule, right? So diminished because that's powerful, right? It's powerful to be empowered. It's powerful to Mm -hmm. hear that optimism and to have it resonate and to go, you know what? That's right. 
We are the United States of America. Damn it, that's our, that is who we are. So stop with the darkness. Stop trying to divide us. Stop with this MAGA BS. Stop with the gaslighting. We are the United States of America. And I think that's going to be the contrast. We see this entire campaign as we see Biden now. He's hitting like a bunch of swing states this month, really ramping it up following the State of the Union. This week alone, he's going to be in New Hampshire, Wisconsin, Michigan, and he's speaking up optimistically about the American experiment, right? He's not playing weird QAnon music and speaking about how we're a nation in decline. We're a failing nation. We're the worst nation in the world. That's what Donald Trump does. No, President Biden speaks optimistically about our country, what we need to do better. And he has a positive vision for the future. And he summed it up well, you know, in a speech over the weekend. I think this one was in Atlanta when he was saying, you know what? This Donald Trump guy and I, we have we have a bit of a different value set, as I think you know. Trump and I have a very different value set of economics already. Mine is based on core values of the defined America. And the rest of the world looks at us that way. Decency, honesty, fairness, equality. But we all know Donald Trump sees a different America. An American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution. That's not me, that's not you. This election is so much more than about these individuals, right? It's so much more than just being about Joe Biden or Donald Trump. It's about who are we as Americans? Who is this country going to be for in the future? And what are the values that we're fighting for? And do we want to be this dark Russian style autocracy? Do we want to look more like Hungary or do we want to look like a modern liberal democracy? And I don't mean that liberal the way that it's used in the political context, but I mean a liberal thriving democracy that, that, that appreciates freedom and liberty. Uh, President Biden went into some of his policies and and his views on how he could uh, decrease housing costs. And he said, you know what we got to do? We got to build, build, build. For those seeking to buy their first home or trade up, for a little more space, I propose the tax cut will provide $400 a month for the next two years. Because every family, every family deserves a place to call home and a place to, to have your American dreams come true. Look, millions of renters are also out there in trouble. We're also cracking down on those landlords who break the antitrust laws by price fixing those rents. Landlords should be competing to give folks the best deal, not conspiring to charge them higher rent. We also cut red tape so more builders can get federal finance, which is already helping construct a record 1.7 million new housing units nationwide. Because of you. And the federal budget that I'm releasing today has a plan for 2 million more affordable homes, including housing, and a housing innovation fund to help communities like yours build housing, renovate housing, and convert empty office space and hotels into housing. Housing for renters, for owners, middle-class families, and folks, folks struggling just to get by. Look, and we, we realize many of you are dealing with homeless encampments in your cities and towns. Well, we're providing $8 billion to allow you to provide alternatives to move unhoused people off the street, getting them into homes. The bottom line is we have to build, build, build. That's how we bring housing costs down for good. It's always like, it's such whiplash to hear somebody actually just speaking about like detailed policy ideas on, on how to actually fix things. And one of, the, one of the things I like that President Biden also does is, you know, we spoke about how weird it was that Donald Trump always goes, and then Trump did this, Trump did that. You never hear Biden do that. In fact, you know, you never hear Biden go, and then Biden went this, and then Biden says that. That would be, you'd be like, what is this guy talking about? But additionally, Biden's, the president, he, he's always like, and you did that. You know, you're the one who made this possible. He always puts it back on the American people. You know, this is inclusive. This is about all of us. Uh, in one moment in one of these speeches uh, over the past few days, uh, President Biden was speaking about Donald Trump inviting Viktor Orban, the Hungarian autocrat, to his Mar-a-Lago resort. Here's what President Biden had to say. It can tell you a lot about a person who he keeps company with. And yesterday he was hosting at his club, Viktor Orban, who says he doesn't think democracy works. Call him a fantastic leader. 
Seriously. He's been sucking up to win him. Oh, anyway. <laughs> at at, at Mar-a-Lago, this is a quote from Donald Trump there. He said, there's nobody that's better, smarter, or a better leader than Viktor Orban. This is the way it's going to be, and that's the end of it. He's the boss, was a direct quote from Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago as he was honoring him there. And then he had like singers perform for Victor. Or the whole thing is, is straight out of one of these bizarro dictatorships. Then Victor Orban made like a campaign video for Donald Trump. Donald Trump told Orban that he's not going to give a single penny to Ukraine if he is president. And even it got to a point where Russia today was even celebrating Victor Orban's return from Mar-a-Lago, saying that Trump told him about all, all the stuff that he's going to do to screw over Ukraine and not give a penny to Ukraine. This is a direct quote from Russian state TV today. This revealed a secret way Trump is planning to end the war in 24 hours. This scheme suits us well. That's a quote from Russian state TV. But OK, so that's Russia. Well, Brett, and you know what like, though, like imagine if President Bill Clinton was praising Slobodan Milosevic like <laughs> and Clinton was like, you know, who is the most respected leader out there? Slobodan Milosevic, like that's actually what this, you know, I mean, Orban's like one degree adjacent to like a Milosevic type of figure. And we would think about that time. Whoa, could you imagine in the mid 1990s if you had Bob Dole running on, you know what, I'm a Milosevic guy, you know, and and or, <laughs> you know, or, 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 or you go George W. Bush and John Kerry or George W. Bush, Al Gore. How about George W. Bush, Al Gore? And George W. Bush was like, you know who we need to become allied with? Slobodan Milosevic and Kim Jong. And I think at that time it was Kim Jong Il. Mm -hmm. Kim Jong Il at that time. And you'd be like, okay, what? That's the Republican Party today, folks, for you. That's the Republican Party. Sorry, bro. Anyway, back in normal land, we heard uh, Donald Trump earlier on that Squawk Box clip say that he is going to cut Social Security and Medicare. And so almost immediately after President Biden issued a response during one of his events. Many of my Republican friends want to put Social Security and Medicare back on the chalking block, block again. If anyone tries to cut Social Security and Medicare or raise retirement age again, I will stop them. <laughs> working, working people built this country. They pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. Folks, we have two ways to go at Social Security and Medicare. Republicans will cut Social Security and Medicare to give us more tax cuts for the wealthy. Even this morning, Donald Trump said cuts to Social Security and Medicare are on the table again. And Ben, here was the clip that you were referencing earlier where, where President Biden calls out just this corrosive MAGA culture that they have and how there are kids who are being influenced by this disgusting behavior. And just listen to the story that President Biden tells. You. Because the soul of the country is who we are. Look, you know, did you ever think, those of you who are over 40, did you ever think <laughs> we'd be in a situation where we talk to each other like we talk these days? Why you see things that we see that no matter how tense things were, and they're really tough in other parts of our history. When you ride down the street and there was a Trump banner with a FU on it and a little and a six year old kid putting up his middle finger. Did you ever say no, I'm serious. Did you ever think you'd hear people talk the way they do? Look, it demeans it demeans who we are. That's not who America that's not America. Those between, those, look, those of us who want to pull America back at the past and those who want to move it into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace the future. I mean it sincerely, freedom, democracy, a future based on the core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, fairness, equality, yeah. just treating people just fairly. No, I really mean it. We don't always live up, but that, that, that that's the American creed. You know, I, I think it's important that this is President Biden's kind of his main message, right? It's about American values and American democracy. And it makes me think I, I, you know, I saw a lot of like bad faith pundits kind of saying that speech at the State of the Union felt awfully lot like a campaign speech and not like a traditional State of the Un Union speech. But honestly, it's not. And I'll tell you why it may have felt that way to people may have felt that way to people because 
the whole MAGA ideology is against everything the United States stands for. It's against mm -hmm. our core That's values, true. right? And so when you have a president up there and he is speaking out in defense of democracy, in defense of funding Ukraine, in defense of the middle class, in defense of, you know, lifting people up out of poverty, when you speak, when you're speaking to fundamental American ideology, fundamental, fundamental core American values, it feels like an attack on the Republican Party. And you know what they say, a hit dog may holler. So when you hear President Biden speak in defense of democracy and then you go hear Republicans go, how dare you attack us? That's what you call a tell. Right. And that was President Biden's whole speech. His whole speech was just a fundamentally American speech that in the past would be a uniting speech that everybody could get behind. Right. There may be some policy differences thrown in the mix, of course. But those big ideas that President Biden was pushing that Republicans were so incredibly offended by are just him say, speaking highly about the American experiment. And there's this just this is corrosiveness right now in this MAGA culture. We speak about this MAGA. Sorry, go on, Ben. And then I'll, I was going to say, so one of the things that the MAGA Republicans in the House of Representatives had as their plan was that they were not going to clap at anything. Normally, there's some bipartisanship at the State of the Union. But here, the MAGA Republicans were like, there's nothing we're going to clap or stand up for. And then you saw on the weekend shows, they tried to use that as one of the reasons that they didn't like the speech. You see, mm -hmm. even the Republicans didn't stand up at any point in time. It's like, okay, how, three years old? Like what is, no offense to three-year-olds. But the way President Biden kind of counted it, truly playing three-dimensional chess was he just spoke to enduring values. I mean, President, we need to be good and decent people and we need to inspire Future generations, the Democrats clap, the Republicans shaking their heads. Republicans oh are like, how dare you say that about me? I'm, there's like, I didn't say anything about you. I just was speaking about uh, America here. But, you know, I, I, I want to talk about this corrosive MAGA culture because while you have President Biden giving this message of optimism, here are what like, the Republicans are doing, right? This is an official uh, Kansas City, uh, Kansas Republican Party hosted fundraiser. And I'll play the video. I'll describe it for the listeners out there. But you see here, this is an event where they feature, it's featuring Ted Nugent, who himself is an accused child molester. And the whole idea of this event is that attendees could donate to a assault a effig an effigy an effigy of president biden they are assaulting like a a doll of president biden they're kicking him they're they're punching him they're hitting him with with poles he's wearing a this he's wearing a let's go brandon shirt like this is really sick stuff that people are taking their kids to and it, it's just it's so out of step with the america i know and it's so out of step with american culture and what i you know it's something i've realized for a long time but what i really kind of realized especially yesterday when the Oscars were on and you just see the endless stream of Republicans whining about the Oscars, you know, and then there's that hilarious Jimmy Kimmel moment at the end because Trump was making, you know, trying to hate on Jimmy Kimmel during the Oscars and never make fun of a, a, a skilled comedian when he's on stage in front of millions and millions of people. What are you doing? Jimmy Kimmel completely just destroyed Donald Trump in one of the best moments, I think. But I, what I realized is, you know, if you look at from the Oscars to things like the Super Bowl to just the NFL in general to the NBA to Bud Light to you know all these things that Dr. Sue like I, I could name all these various things and what I kind of came around to realizing is that Republicans hate American culture they 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 hate modern american culture and i think they hate modern american culture because they feel like the culture has left them behind because the culture has embraced all of america Right. And so mm -hmm. they have this nostalgia, some of it not even like an accurate nostalgia about this culture of like the 1950s. Right. And this whole anti woke movement and all that stuff, it's truly just an anti it's anti modern American culture, because while it doesn't always get it right, our culture has become so much more inclusive and has become for all people. And these people who are fundamentally, a lot of them just, just complete racists or white nationalists, Nazi, like whatever you want to call them. Right. They're uncomfortable by it because of that. So they call it woke, right? They try to push it out. And it just, when it comes down to it, they really don't like America. So what do they do, right? They create their own MAGA culture. 
And what do they do in their MAGA culture? They go to these weird rallies. They go to the border. They sell each other these weird T-shirts. They beat up in, in these things of Joe Biden. Like This is what th this MAGA culture has become. This is their version of culture in this country, which is so far apart from American culture, you know, in, in, in my opinion. And I, I think that you would agree uh, with that. And, you know, I think that's at the heart of it. I saw Elon Musk respond to a post, you know, somebody, one of these people on, on X posted something like uh, at the end of the Oscars yesterday, oh, best director, white man, best actor, white man, screenwriter, white man. And Elon Musk's comment was something to the effect of, oh, so I, I, I guess the Oscars weren't so woke this year after all. I mean, you just kind of gave away what you mean by woke, huh? Like, yeah. like, like, and, and and you play it into my entire thesis of, of what the issue is here. You hate that America has become more inclusive. And that's why you're so angry. That's why you're so livid, because you think that you can't succeed in a world where people who look like you are succeeding. And that is fundamentally the problem. And we can't give those people any air, right? We, we cannot let them because... That's not what America is all about in 2024. It's it simply isn't. And while you have President Biden giving all these inclusive speeches, I want to get some quick economic data. Shortly. Real quick, real quick, what, real quick, Brett, just that B-roll of the Trump supporters beating up on, on the Biden yeah. doll. It, it's a bit poetic in the sense that the doll, the Biden doll comes out on top like these for for alphas. <laughs> right. They're not they're not doing a great job beating this. This guy falls like this guy just lost to boom, gone, lost. <laughs> Like, what? It's a great observation, George. <laughs> it's, it's 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 very poetic of of just of the MAGA mentality and that's the best analysis player. ever. That might be the best analysis ever. You could beat him down. You could throw whatever you want at the guy, but yeah. guess what? He still stands. Democracy and prevails. Your your negative momentum, your negativity, will only knock you down. Like this guy right here. Ready? Yeah. Boom. Oh, bring <laughs> you such, down. It's it's such a good call. And while you have. President Biden, you know, I think one of the great things he did recently, too, was how he reached out to the Nikki Haley voters. We spoke to that last week after Nikki Haley uh, suspended her campaign. And, you know, I, I saw some people go, but what? But Nikki Haley, but what about progressives? And that, you know, I mean, you could do it all right. It's not an either or thing. I just want to be clear about that. But I think it's important that Joe Biden is building his campaign, his reelection effort using addition. He's trying to say this is about America. Right. A lot of things we say on the show, like, come join me. That's what it's all about. We could disagree on the issues, but we should all agree on this American experiment. Mm -hmm. And what Donald Trump and these Republicans are saying is you don't you don't agree with the cult. You don't want to follow this cult leader. Then get the hell out. You don't belong here. And you see Donald Trump saying that and you see people in the Republican Party saying that. And I wanted to play quickly this call uh, Andy Biggs received on the C-SPAN hit today. And it, it was a conservative who was concerned about the party. And I want you to hear what Andy Biggs says to him. And the divisiveness that I've seen uh, from my party um, in the past 40 years has got me uh, kind of puzzled. I just registered as a Republican two months ago uh, for the fifth time, Mr. Biggs. And uh, I'm just going to leave you with this comment, and that is that uh, I register as a Republican uh, because I'm a conservative and I'm going to vote for Joe Biden because I'm a Christian. Thank you for listening. Mr. Biggs. Well, I think that's really interesting. Um, uh, he probably should re-register as a Democrat. Um, I, I think if you're not voting for Donald Trump because you think he's not a Christian or not a moral man, um, I, you know, I'm not going to say look at Joe Biden. I would just say um, we should all look at ourselves and see see who's casting the first stone. Yeah, you should look at yourselves and, and then your your things. Yeah, I was saying, I don't even know what that means when he says that. Look at exactly, bro. Look, yeah, at look, your... look, look at yourself. And I want to show this post also that, you know, Donald Trump just did this repost, which speaks to this exact idea that we're speaking about, right? Instead of saying, you know what, I understand your concerns and I assume we disagree on the issues, but here is why I think you should vote for our candidate. And here is my defense of conservative values, right? That's what Andy Biggs could have said. Instead, he said, well, I guess he should register as a Democrat then, okay? I guess he should. Here's what Donald Trump posted. Just This has just happened. Donald Trump uh, did this repost on his social media of this uh, meme that says from some account named 
ultra extremely stable genius on Truth Social. And the meme says, I'm not voting Republican. I'm voting Trump. The entire party has been now revolves around this cult, this personality cult. And anyone who does not bow down to the cult Jeez, yeah. is cast out of the party. So when you're looking at the upcoming elections and you see one candidate saying literally verbatim, I'm a president for all Americans. I believe in America. Joe Biden. And then you look at the other side and you see America is a nation in decline. And if you don't support me, then get the hell out. Those are two fundamentally different visions of the country. One is by addition. One is by subtraction. And I think that is going to be one of the deciding factors of this election. Jordy, quickly, and then I'll get into the economics. Yeah, just real quick on Andy Biggs right there. So the reason why it didn't make any sense is because he kind of boxed himself into a corner because he couldn't use Biden's, you know, the Biden phrase, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. <laughs> He couldn't use that there because if you do compare each candidate, if you stack one up against each other, I mean, it couldn't be more clear who has integrity and who doesn't, right? Like when we hear the Biden speech versus the Trump speech, it, it's hope over despair. You know, it, it's compassion over hate. It, it's frankly reason over treason. And so and the worst thing in the world a Republican could do is, is compare a Donald Trump next to Joe Biden, because Donald Trump's moral failures are just, you know, magnified times a thousand when you're looking at someone who actually stands for democracy, who, who stands for compassion like President Biden. Yeah, it's like, all right, keep 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 defending the rapist and say you're behind Christian values. It's like, all right, all right, all right buddy. All right. All right. right. Anyway, Probably. let's get into some news about the economy because there's a lot of good news to report about the economy. A lot more evidence of resilience in this American economy. We we received a stunning jobs report again. It was Jobs Day last week. And what did we get? 275,000 new jobs created in February. At the same time, unemployment remaining under 4% for the 25th month straight. That's two years and running the longest stretch of unemployment in 50 years. And I want to show you this chart here. It's something that we've said on the show before, but I think this really visualizes it for us. It shows how the change in GDP in the United States, how we have increased uh, higher, faster than any other of the G7 nations here. You could see the US far outpacing Canada, France, the UK, Germany, and Japan. You see that our economy is far and away doing better than other economies in in the modern world. You're also seeing here that Biden's first three years in office have seen the fastest real GDP growth since Bill Clinton's first term on this chart. I mean, the data is undeniable and obviously, you know, things aren't perfect everywhere and, and there is a lot of economic disparity and there's a lot of work to do, but especially coming out of this COVID crisis, coming out of this global pandemic to see the resilience of the economy and just the way that the United States has been growing compared to other countries. I mean, we're number one. If you're number one at anything, that should go a, a little bit, right? They, that should mean something. And then this is just a point I really want to hit before we go, because you hear Donald Trump and these Trump supporters, they invent this concept that the United States was energy independent over Donald Trump, which is not a true thing. And they say that Joe Biden ruined energy independence. Well, it's just a made up talking point. But you know who has achieved energy independence in the United States? President Joe Biden. This is from not Brett Micellis or Midas Touch. This is from the analyst at J.P. Morgan, the, the famous libs at, at J.P. Morgan. <laughs> and J.P. Morgan said the U.S. has achieved U.S. energy independence for the first time in 40 years while Europe and China compete for global energy resources. And you can see the chart once again right here that shows the U.S. as energy independent. So you could share this chart with all your friends. You know, if you're listening on audio, you come back, take a screenshot of it. And anytime anybody goes, oh, the, the, the country is no longer energy independent. You got the country wasn't energy independent over Trump. You know who the country is energy independent under? Joe Biden for the first time in 40 years. That's my update. Ben, I'll kick it back to you. Brett, I'm excited to hear more about your meeting with Vice President Harris. I want to hear about that. I know you're going to be some sharing some exclusive photos at our Patreon. You know, we don't have outside investors here at the Midas Touch Network yet, despite the fact that Fox has revenue of about $15 billion a year and major shareholders. And let's just say, without revealing any trade secrets, 
we don't. <laughs> we, 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 we are building this through the great emojis that you buy from the YouTube channel. Hit that dollar sign below for the emojis. That's separate from Patreon. Support our pro-democracy sponsors. Um, Jordy does an incredible job vetting our sponsors. Brett does an incredible job testing and loving our sponsors, as do I. It's some great, and it's a way to the growth of the channel as well and really get some great products and great things there. And then our Patreon is a great place to become a member where you'll watch exclusive after shows and other exclusive content. And it's just a way for us not to try to gatekeep with anything, but like we just want to find fun and unique ways if we're competing against all the big media companies to try to grow this. So that's a way for you to- Also, Ben, contribute. not to mention, like if like the last week there was a, a day or like the week before where YouTube went down in the morning and we didn't have mm. a few videos in the morning. And like, we, you know, it's we get so many emails when that happens. And so having another outlet also where we could release those videos on like Patreon, you know, it's it's it's- a good way if anything ever happens to youtube you know you go to patreon we'll post the videos there i want to also give a shout out to some of the youtube channels that we are officially partnered with now as well as midas continues to expand thanks to your support in the ways that we just said um so we're partnered with the tennessee brando youtube channel okay. so make sure you go to ten just search on youtube tennessee brando he does an incredible job there subscribe to tennessee brando's youtube channel um i think he's a very important voice right now mm -hmm. so subscribe to that youtube channel when it comes to gen z we're partnered with Adam Mockler's YouTube channel. So go over there, subscribe to Mockler's YouTube channel. When it comes to some more nuanced analysis from retired federal prosecutors, former federal prosecutors, and current federal prosecutors, you go to Talking Feds, Harry Lippman, a former top DOJ official who we're partnered with. You go to Talking Feds and you subscribe to that YouTube channel. We're continuing to grow over the next weeks. We'll have some other great announcements that we're going to make. But Tennessee Brando, Adam Mockler, Talking Feds, subscribe to those. Make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. Thank you all so much for watching this. Um, go to patreon.com slash Midas Touch. We appreciate you. We're grateful for you. And we'll see you next time. Have a good one. Jordy, take it away. Shout out to the Midas Mighty! The Midas Mighty standing strong Against the fascists we sing our song We will get it right whenever At Midas Touch, we are unapologetically pro-democracy and we demand justice and accountability. That's why we're spreading our message to Convict 45. That's right, gear up right now with your Convict 45 tees and pins at store.midastouch.com. That's store.midastouch.com.